Good evening and welcome to the Fort Worth Open Space Conservation Program public meeting. Um, I would just like to let you know a few housekeeping rules. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please use the chat feature and you can share your comments and we'll try to get to them um, as we go through the presentation. And then any of those questions that do get submitted to the chat, uh, will be answered uh, during the question and answer session. So we'll make sure to get to everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us and for all of your feedback. This is going to really help us um, make sure that we're considering the right things as we develop this program. And so I want to start with tonight. Oops, sorry about that. I want to start with tonight's agenda. Um, we are going to be going over an overview of the open space conservation program. We're going to talk about our modeling goals, and that'll make a little bit more sense here in a bit. And uh, we're going to talk about our public survey, and then we'll have our question and answer session. Okay, so first of all, uh, the open space conservation program was developed to conserve high quality natural areas in the city. And this is especially important as Fort Worth continues to grow. Um, the entire region has experienced tremendous growth over the past couple of decades. And so as um, we continue to develop out, we want to make sure that we're capturing these natural spaces that provide environmental benefits and recreational opportunities for our residents and as well as support uh, econo economic development and enhance our livability. And so uh, one of the reasons we want to conserve open space, it helps us achieve our vision of being the most livable city in the country. And it also uh, accomplishes a lot of our city council strategic goals. So we want to make Fort Worth the nation's safest major city. And it may not be obvious right off the bat uh, what open space has to do with uh, safety, but uh, one of the main uh, categories that we're looking at uh, with open space is flood protection and uh, stormwater detention. So things that will help uh, prevent flooding uh, in the future, as well as uh, provide those uh, natural floodplains. And we want to improve mobility and air quality as we preserve these areas, these natural spaces with uh, trees that helps protect our um, our air quality, uh, and obviously these open spaces are attractive. You know, we've got some beautiful uh, open prairie and river scenes and lakes, and um, we want to make sure that we preserve those for future generations. And we can also strengthen our economic base, as a lot of companies um, want to move to this area. They are looking for things like uh, open spaces for their campuses, places where they can uh, allow their employees to recreate on their lunch hour. Um, it helps us uh, improve the sustainability of our development. Um, when we preserve these open spaces, it allows for higher de density development around those to give more people access to these places. And so one of the first questions that always comes up is what is the difference between open space versus parkland? And um, the biggest thing is experiencing nature. So in a park, like you see in the right hand picture, you may have more mowed lawns and playground equipment, basketball courts, things that are very structured. Whereas the picture on the left, you're seeing really natural spaces with maybe just a few paved trails um, and very little in the way of actual physical structures or, or pavement. We really want to connect people with natural spaces that are maintained in a different way than your traditional parks. And so the city started looking at this. We've got a great parts, park system, uh, but we also want to make sure that we have these green spaces that are preserved in a more natural state. So we brought in people from across the city, all different departments that are part of this ongoing team. And this uh, program started in the fall of 2019. 
and incorporated all of the different departments you see here, as well as some of our partners at the Council of Governments, uh, Streams and Valleys, and the Regional Water District. And then we also brought in a contractor, the Trust for Public Land, which is natural, nationally recognized for their work in open space and park conservation. And so the other thing that comes up right away is how are we going to pay for this? So some of the ideas uh, that we're proposing for funding sources are future bond programs. Uh, there's a lot of partnership and grant opportunity that comes up with this through entities like the uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife or our regional government. Uh, we're also going to utilize some of our gas well, gas well trust fund uh, money for this park dedication fees, and then maybe some special revenue funds. We could be looking at open spaces that we're acquiring jointly with the water department where they may need to place some infrastructure, but we could also preserve uh, natural space around that. Uh, the same for stormwater and um, environmentally to protect our streams and rivers. So we have a lot of different opportunities with open space for funding. And one of the first places, um, actually the first place that we were able to acquire under this program was Broadcast Hill. And uh, this was just in June of last year. And so we used some of those uh, gas well revenue uh, funds as well as funds raised by the community. So Broadcast Hill came to our attention uh, from residents they wanted to protect this as an iconic place in the city, and it was also adjacent to the Tandy Hills uh, natural area. And so it has, uh, you know, remnant prairie. It's got a lot of species that you don't find in large areas um, like Broadcast Hill across the city. And so uh, we worked with community members to make this our first open space acquisition. And then we, um, as we were going through this process, like I mentioned earlier, we contracted with the Trust for Public Land. And what they're doing for us is we are giving them all of the data related to open space um, throughout the city. And they are creating a tool that helps us prioritize areas. So that's the big question is uh, what areas are more important for us to go in and acquire through this program? And that's what this tool is going to do in a very objective way. And so uh, we have all of these different goals that we want to accomplish with the model. And um, they're listed here under recreation, community health, equitable access. So we're taking all of these um, different goal areas and we're putting all of the data into the model. And uh, this picture is an example uh, under our equitable access category. We're looking at the percent of low income in our different census tracts because we want to make sure that we're not just serving the same parts of town that uh, we are capturing everyone that we're getting to our underserved communities and making sure that they have access to open space as well. And so once you have all of these different layers put in the model with all this different data, we're going to weight the different uh, criteria and that's where the public input comes in. We want to know what is most important to you uh, as we go through these goals. And so I'll go into a little bit more detail here on the goals. Uh, so when we talk about recreation in natural spaces, we might be talking about things like uh, kayak launches, trailheads. Uh, it would be more natural interaction, bird watching, things that you would do um, on uh, hiking trips and things like that. Uh, when we're talking about community health, uh, we want to reduce exposure to things like the urban heat island by maintaining some of the natural spaces in our very developed areas. Uh, we're going to be looking at health data, so zip codes that tend to have high instances of things like diabetes or asthma, things that are related to lack of access to recreation. Uh, when we're looking at equitable access, again, we're looking at those underserved and marginalized communities. And then with flood control, we're looking at um, not just our floodplains, but other flood, flood prone areas throughout the city. 
uh, so that we can help alleviate some of that flooding by capturing it in these natural spaces. And then we're also looking at stream, river, and lake health. Uh, any of our environmentally impaired water bodies, we want to make sure that we're protecting the areas around those to prevent additional pollution from entering those streams, rivers, and lakes. And then with economic development, we can help spur development in certain areas um, when we're looking at mixed use areas and transit or oriented areas, we want to make those trail connections and we want to provide that open space for as many people as possible in these higher density areas. And then with ecosystem preservation, um, these are our woodlands and prairies and endangered habitats as well as the habitats of endangered animals. So we're looking at all of these different things together and that is what we're going to get to in our public survey. We encourage everyone who's on here to take our survey. We want to hear feedback from you on what's most important in those models. So is recreation the thing that's most important to you? Is having uh, access close by? Uh, is it protecting certain habitats or flood control? Because each of those different categories and all the data that goes into it is going to be weighted differently according to the feedback that we get from our residents. So it's really important that we hear from you. And uh, you can access this survey directly through the links that are shown here, and I'll make sure to put those in the chat box so you can grab them. Uh, but I also want to show you our website. You can go to um, fortworthopenspace.org and that's going to pull up the joint website with the Trust for Public Land in Fort Worth. And you can scroll down here and we have the English and Spanish versions of the survey, as well as some of our resources and videos from our first stakeholder meetings. So you can get additional information uh, on our website as well. And so let me jump back in here. And if there's anything that you think of beyond this meeting, please feel free to contact us at uh, Fort Worth, uh, open space at fortworthtexas.gov. So I'm gonna grab these links real quick and then I'm going to jump into the chat box so I can start answering some questions. So give me just a moment. And I'm going to put these in here for everyone. Okay, so there's to the English survey, and here is the link to the Spanish survey. So in the first questions, we got, oh, how do you define high quality? Well, that's a good question, and it kind of goes back to um, the modeling goals that we're trying to achieve. So high quality can be defined, high quality habitat might mean that there are rare or endangered species versus a lot of invasive species or um, things that we're going to need to clean up environmentally. So we really want to capture those uh, natural spaces that are as close to natural state as possible versus something like a brown field that has already been developed that we would have to turn back into uh, a natural space. And then um, the email address, you can absolutely reach me directly, brandy.kelp at fortworthtexas.gov. Or you can uh, email our open space team. And this goes to everyone on that team. So sometimes we're able to get back to you a little quicker. But I want to make sure that you have our contact information. And then uh, Scenic Fort Worth Board. Oh, you guys are here. So uh, welcome. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to jump in here. I'm going to unmute everyone. And then um, I would like to hear from you. So if you have any questions, please feel free to share them at this time. So Brandy, thanks. Um, Margaret DeMoss here from uh, Scenic Fort Worth. Um, I uh, I apologize. I was having to, I don't know, uh, WebEx wanted to upgrade itself before I signed on. I've so I, I, that happen. <laughs> I, I didn't hear you introduce yourself. What department are you are you in? 
Um, I'm actually a senior planner in our stormwater department, um, but before I took on this role overseeing our open space program, I was actually in our environmental quality division uh, and I oversaw our keep Fort Worth beautiful uh, litter volunteer program. Okay, so this, so this initiative does fall in the stormwater. Um, it does, but you may not, okay. yeah, you may not have seen our slide. I'm going to jump back here because. Our team that meets on a weekly basis is very much cross departmental. So um, every week people from across the city meet on this program. And it's been a great opportunity for us. We've really been able um, to identify a lot of challenges and overcome um, any issues very quickly because we're all working together. We've got our park and recreation department, uh, development, we've got environmental um, property management, everyone is collaborating on this and it's made a really robust program very quickly because we started this program came into being at a meeting in September of 2019 and by June of last year, we had already made our first acquisition. Uh, so it's moving very quickly and I attribute a lot of that to um, the cross departmental work that we're doing. I love that. Thanks. Were there any other questions or comments out there? I want to make sure that we get to everyone. All right. Um, if there are no other questions, oh, here we go. How much? Do you think public support popularity app uh, will affect the city's ability to acquire? So actually we've had broad public support for this program. Um, we did a survey before this program and found that about, I think 80% of the city uh, wanted to see open space preservation. Um, so it seems like, uh, there has been across the board uh, support. We've received a lot of support directly from our city manager's office, from a lot of our council members. Um, so it, it has really been robust. Um, right now we're working on identifying all the different uh, funding sources. And one thing that Trust for Public Land is doing for us is they're benchmarking other cities. So they're asking how other cities are funding their open space programs to give recommendations to our city council so that we can uh, make sure that we have the funding necessary. Uh, but we've already been given um, the okay to use some of those gas well funds and we're working with parks and the water department and some of our other departments on joint acquisitions where it makes sense. So um, it it's really, it hasn't been an issue so far, thankfully. That's great. I, I, actually, one reason I ask is sort of out of fear, maybe I'm, I'm sort of thinking back to the, the era of the Tea Party and uh, and just how challenging, you know, there there are kind of cycles in public opinion and and rightly so, right? There's kind of a, you know, push and pull there of the demand for and desire for great civic assets. And then the, uh, you know, the, the voices that say, now, wait a minute, is that really our priority? And so this just, it seems to me like parks, open spaces, et cetera, are always vulnerable, you know, to austerity voices. And so I was just, thinking about this because I don't know when we, we get a chance to speak again that I, I hope that that we are collectively mindful of this just so that we're making and I think you did a good job by the way but thinking about <laughs> how 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 we uh, like my mind goes to sort of long-term economic health of cities and yes, you look yes. right now I'll just plant the seed in cases of any value with with what a totally different you know decade or decades of of people choosing where they live based on where they work. In my opinion, cities are entering into an arms race of amenities. And I say amenities, that doesn't mean, you know, the kind of amenities you put in parks, but rather how great of a place do you offer talented people who can afford to move wherever they want? Um, how great of an environment do you offer those people? And of course, no city can afford everything, but I think that it's, it's, it's probably wise to look at it through that lens. And, and if you look at one of the, the categories where we're probably a little weak currently, 
it would be this sort of thing. It's access to nature, you know, especially in light of how people have needed to clear their head um, and <laughs> walk in natural spaces in the last nine, 10 months. Um, uh, I just did it today on the river. Um, that having not just quantity of spaces, but quantity and quality of spaces, even if it's a drive to, you know, for people is, is the difference between, you know, recruiting some people who are really desirable people who will kind of drive the next employers in town, pay a lot of taxes, et cetera. So I think there's an indirect payback that uh, maybe Trust for Public Land and somebody else has some data that they tracked on that. But yes, we, and we, that, that is one of, we don't already have a mountain range next door. Oh, yeah, no, we've um, that's part of the consideration that goes into this whenever we're looking at um, properties that we may want to acquire. Um, you know, if, if we put in, you know, if we if we preserve these open spaces, you know, what does that allow us to do that allows us to make trail connections that may not have happened. And we know that property values around those trail connections tend to be higher. Uh, allows us, like I said, to build at a higher density, which again increases our tax base and gives more people access to these places at the same time. So there's definitely a lot of synergy between open space and economic opportunity while growing sustainably. And so it really, the open space program really um, helps us achieve so many of the city's strategic goals and the overall vision of being the most livable city. And um, I, I think that there's broad recognition for that, both um, within the city and uh, with the public. And uh, like I said, it, it's received such broad support because each department can see the value of open space for their own programs. And I think that really helps drive this program forward and is why um, it has moved so quickly and so successfully so far. Are, are we looking at uh, at conservation easements as a, a method to achieve either, you know, contiguous open spaces or, or just freestanding ones? Yeah, a conservation easement, it's one of those that's in the toolbox, of course, that's applied to private open space. So that mm -hmm. would obviously, and I, I should say, when we're looking at acquiring open space, we are looking at voluntary acquisition and any conservation easement would also be uh, voluntary as well. Um, but we would absolutely encourage um, you know, developers, property owners uh, to look at conservation easement as a tool. Um, we're also looking at the potential for um, the land trusts and things like that, that some of the other cities um, might have and, and where it's operated by a third party. And so we're looking at all of these different uh, tools as a means to achieve the same thing. So whether the city owns it and operates it, or whether there's a conservation or public access um, ability, you know, on a private open space. We're looking at all those different options. Absolutely. And it, uh, we have another question here from Margaret. Is there a budget goal for the percentage of public and private dollars? Um, so far, we do not have a goal of uh, specifically for that. Uh, we're still taking a look at, like I said, the benchmarking from other cities. Uh, TPL is still working on that. And um, we're also looking at the total budget for the program as a whole. It is so new and it's still in development, so we don't have uh, the final numbers yet. And a lot of it comes down to the cost to acquire the property varying very widely depending on if we're talking about an open space in an infill um, developed environment, or if we're talking about an open space, um, like in the extraterritorial jurisdiction, you know, the, the land values can vary, you know, widely. And then um, with public and private dollars, I'm not sure if we're going to set a goal, we'll find out. Um, but we always keep the option of 
private funding and um, donations like the donation of land or uh, the donation of funding for acquisition, as well as time. Uh, we are going to be looking at potential volunteer programs for this because um, it's not just the initial uh, acquisition of these properties, it's the ongoing maintenance as well. And um, so we're looking at all of those things and working on developing a budget for that, but it's something that's ongoing as of this time. Um, thanks. So in your benchmarking with other um, cities and other similar programs, is there a recommended um, minimum size for these open spaces? Um, I'm thinking of our, you know, our pocket parks, which you, you adequately, you know, differentiated between parks and open space, but is there sort of the smallest minimum recommended for um, open spaces? We don't, I, I don't know, um, I don't have the um, answers yet from the benchmark, but I can tell you as we've given our own recommendations into the development of the modeling tool, um, We've specified that in highly, highly developed areas like downtown, you know, we really want to look down to things that are maybe a quarter of an acre or even a little less because that size of an open space can actually have a huge impact if you have a large community or transit oriented development around it. So um, we haven't developed really any specific cutoffs, but um, I, I definitely think that the range, you know, in that inner city area, we'd be looking at at least a quarter acre above. And then probably more out um, in the far west or far north where you have that extraterritorial jurisdiction, because there we'd want to be capturing large habitats and um, contiguous open space. Brandy? But again, you can give those recommendations for us in that public survey. So absolutely, please give us that kind of feedback. Uh, Brandy, this is Judy Harmon, and I'm also with Scenic Fort Worth. Uh, and I want to just give underline the need in the center city where we have mixed use and urban residential and the other more highly dense developments. Um, we are not capturing space there to make them long-term, to maintain the long-term value and to make keep them livable and healthy. So I, I just want to underline that need. Yes, and in a lot of, uh, we have a specific economic development section in the modeling goal, but even in some of the other areas, we prioritize based on land use. And again, you can help us determine those weights that you would like to see. Um, but we are specifically looking at uh, the future land use in Fort Worth, like the mixed use areas and the high density and transit oriented development. And so those particular land uses can have higher values um, in the modeling tool. So um, when it calculates all the different weights from all the different layers, you know, it's assigning those higher values to those types of areas, especially when we're talking about certain modeling goals. And I definitely, um, that that is one where we're really trying to push uh, uh, to, to weight more heavily so that we are improving the sustainability of those areas um, and driving that economic base as well, just like you said. And did we have any other questions? Uh, this is kind of a, a, a tactical question, I suppose. Um, sure. <laughs> so it, it's uh, land acquisition is very labor intensive. Uh, who mm -hmm. on staff is doing that? Um, so we actually have multiple people, but um, property management actually heads up um, our acquisitions. They have the expertise and the knowledge to do that. So once we find an area and we say, yeah, that we want this, this one is the one that we're interested in. Um, we ask our property management to come in and get involved so that they can help us with the appraisals and all of those different things, um, like the due diligence of the site. So, again, that really comes back to it being that interdepartmental effort. If you were if you were speculating at this point, do you think we'll see some kind of large scale 
uh, you know, what, what currently is exurban sort of perimeter ETJ locations, you know, that will be surrounded by homes in the next decade or two, like, and, and, and potentially would you see, you think that those would span a bunch of different current property owners and um, in like floodplains uh, probably? Yeah. Um, so floodplain again is one of those things that we're looking at, you know, those higher weights. Um, and one of the challenges with the ETJ, the extraterritorial jurisdiction, is that we have less data for that area. Um, so we've tried to counterbalance that by weighting some things in the ETJ a little bit higher. But we definitely have to prioritize the need of our current residents. Um, and so they may or may not be served as well by the ETJ, but that is included in our modeling area. So it's it's something that we've looked at and we're also considering development pressure. So we're looking at places where we know there's a lot of been a lot of development interest in saying, OK, we need to get in early and our parks, you know, our water department already does this um, when they're looking at infrastructure. And so we're saying, OK, what do we need to acquire to be able to support development in this area from an infrastructure standpoint? And so now we're kind of bringing in the open space uh, concept to that idea. Uh, did that answer your question specifically? I, I don't know if I, I skirted around. Yeah, it too much. <laughs> I, think I was listening for was whether you were going to say, look, you know, if it looks like it's three to. Complicated, we'll probably stay away from that. Or that's where I was thinking easements might come in. So there's some sort of thin connection or something, you know, or it sounds like maybe they'll they'll tolerate more complicated transactions. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, if there's multiple. Um, uh, landowners involved and things like that. No, that's not going to knock it out. It's it's not it's not part of our modeling criteria. We are looking for those high quality spaces, and then once we find them, uh, we'll have to look at the you know cost to acquire and and those other factors. But um, no, that that doesn't get incorporated into the model. And so if we find something great and there's 10 property owners attached, then that's what we'll do. We'll work with those property owners. And again, like you said, we may we may be looking at um, working with them from a conservation easement standpoint or um, some type of land trust. So we'll use every tool available to help us acquire those spaces that we identify. Great. And I hope that answered your question. I know we're running a little over time, but I don't want to leave anyone out. If there are any further questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. All right. Well, um, if there's anything else that you can think of, of course, you can reach out to us um, at the open space uh, at fortworthtexas.gov email address. And again, you can visit the project website. And please, if, if there's one takeaway from tonight, I cannot stress highly enough, please take that survey so we can get as much feedback from the community as possible. And uh, I hope you all have a fabulous night and um, keep an eye on that website. We'll be putting all of our updates on that as we develop this program. Thanks for doing this. So thank you all and have a good night.